Hey everybody, welcome to the book Leads Impactful Books for Life and Leadership. I'm your series host and leadership performance coach, John Jermillo. This podcast series is about getting to the books that have impacted the lives of my co-workers, colleagues, people in my network. So these are great leads that I'll be interviewing on the books that we cover in the series. I want to know which are the books that have impacted them the most, influenced the most, so that we can kind of all extract that value from these books. And there are three types of books that I cover on the series. The first one is where they're sharing a book with me that I haven't read. Second book or category is one that we've both covered, both read, whether specifically for the series or in our previous lives. The third category is when I get to speak to the authors and or publishers about the books to, to share the message that they're trying to get out there to the audience. Uh, in this particular episode, I'm lucky enough to have a repeat guest, an author and herself, Dr. Bridget Cooper, Dr. B is a cage rattler who helps teams and leaders think and communicate more clearly and strategically so they can work and navigate problems proactively and effectively. She works with clients to overcome the attitudes, tactics, and patterns that derail their success through coaching, corporate consulting, and leading workshops that guide and uh, inspire people to live more authentic, peaceful, and powerful lives. A TEDx speaker and a best-selling author of seven books on communication, conflict, change, and empowerment, including the 2023 toolkit Unflappable, her mission is to change the world one life at a time. Dr. B volunteers for Junior Achievement, Lasagna Love, the Miss America Organization, Connecticut Children's Medical Center, and various other charities near and dear to her heart. And Bridget and I met through mutual connections. She's been with me on the series before in episode 24 when we covered her book, Pain Rebel, how we take our power back. And we were just talking about that. That was in April, 2022. We're now in October of 2023, a year and a half later. It's amazing how time just flies by uh, mm -hmm. in the blink of an eye. That <laughs> conversation seemed like it was just yesterday. So Bridget, again, thanks for coming back and joining me. Oh my goodness, John, thank you for having me. I, and what you didn't tell uh, on this episode was that our last episode, we had never spoken before I came on air with you. And so what, if you go back and listen to that episode, and just see the just the natural evolution of that conversation. It was just just two great minds coming together, talking about important things, important topics, and riffing off each other. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Now that I do know you better, now that I've been following yeah. you and connecting with you outside of uh, this forum, it's cool. It's great. Yeah, it's amazing when you can talk to somebody. Um, and like I said, your network is important. The people you are already know are great. Mm -hmm. uh, but every once in a while, you just come across somebody that has like the same drive for changing the world. Like you yeah. say one life at a time. I don't take that lightly. Yeah. I take that literally. I, mm -hmm. I love that kind of impact. I realize that those are the people that I'm drawn to, um, that they don't underestimate themselves. They really mm -hmm. want to change their world, their community as small or as big of a ripple as they can impact at whatever time. So yeah. I'm lucky that our paths crossed and I'm Glad you were willing to come back for a different, uh, a second conversation. Same, yeah. I think it's. I think when you figure out what it is that you were put here for, and it doesn't mean a job title, it means an energetic footprint, a kind of impact that you want to have. It it just lights you up, right? It moves you toward moving obstacles out of the way. Uh, you know, facing down challenges, overcoming you know doldrums or whatever might be pulling you back. And you really want to engage in the world. It's it's why mission led organizations and leaders and humans are they leave a greater impact. They have a, a bigger story. They have a bigger reach because of that. So yeah, we both are coming from that similar. <laughs> yeah, and it's one of those things where if you tell a younger person coming out of college or going into the trades, whatever they may do, maybe going towards in their career. Yeah. When you tell them that, it's like they're like, oh, okay, okay, I've heard that before, but. At one yeah. point, you just hit your stride where you find what you're all about, right. what you can contribute, what is really uniquely you. And once you get into that zone, it's like all the fear that you may have had before when you mm -hmm. didn't know what was going on or for you, what you needed to do for yourself. It just it just isn't there because you just don't. Again, it sounds hokey, but you just don't see any limitations because you realize mm -hmm. Like that source of power that you always needed to sustain you is right. is internal. If you're a dreamer, if you want to create something, if you want to put something good out there, I mean, it's all there inside you for the taking. But we spend so much of our lives looking outside of ourselves to find it. Yeah, and I and I don't know about you, but I what I have witnessed from the people who have made those powerful shifts and investments in the way that they bring their gifts to the world often have found a 
a crossroads at a really difficult moment in their life. You know, whether it was the death of someone close to them or an illness or an injury or a loss of some sort or a, a trauma or witnessing something, some injustice, something. And that negative experience, and it's been proven over and over again in the literature, that in order to really move forward from those negative experiences, it's not just to adjust to them. It's to actually move yourself above and beyond them. And that's that's really where a lot of that, I think, power and, and that source of power comes from is not to look at those negative events as regrets, even if they were your choosing, right, that you messed yeah. up and you really screwed something up, is to look at them and go, how can that bring me closer to my purpose and passion and bring a change to the world that's so necessary? Yeah. And what comes up in these conversations when we talk about that kind of thing um, where the guests may have experienced some kind of trauma or disruption early in their life. Mm -hmm. um, I always ask that question yeah. about their childhood. And it's like, looking back, they wouldn't change what happened to them because right. it made them who they are today. Right. Shitty I remember, to yeah. go through there, <laughs> shitty yeah. to go through it, but you know, it makes you who you are today. So all the yeah. downtimes you and I have had in our own lives way right. back when, whatever may have happened, it's like, you know, it is that butterfly effect where if that yeah. thing didn't happen, it would have put you on a different course and, and you wouldn't maybe yeah. the passion you feel now, maybe you wouldn't, wouldn't have felt it if you didn't go through that particular right. change point in your life. Right. And then we'll and, never know, right? Cause you can never go back and change the past. But I remember sitting in my therapist's office, I was 18 years old. I was in college. I was, you know, having the, just a, decompensating, right? Just like looking at everything that had happened, trying to figure out who I was, trying to adult in some fashion before adult, uh, adulting was a word that we <laughs> used colloquially. And I remember saying to my therapist, I can't wait to be on the other side of this because I'm going to make, I'm going to bring so much good to the world as a result of this. I'm going to be so grateful this happened. And she was like, um, no. And I said, Absolutely. Yes. Like that is my purpose here. Like that's what's driving me every day is not only to feel better for myself, but to take this and say, you know what, I'm going to make ever, like as many people as I can positively touch and I will negatively touch a, a, a few along the journey, but I'm going to do as much as I can to bring that healing into the world because I, because of whatever I figured out from my own pain and struggle. Look at us diving right into it, even before right? the questions. Right. Okay, I have one more, one more, <laughs> one more comment on what you're saying before we dive into the question. So, it. where do you think that kind of insight, that kind of wisdom, where did that happen? Mm. Because whatever, whatever the yeah. trauma was, whatever the challenge was, at that age, it doesn't seem like that's enough, or it right. wouldn't seem like that's enough. To have an 18 year old say, listen, I'm going to come out of this even better. I'm going to impact people as best as yeah. I can. That's going to be my thing. Obviously, an adult hearing that is going to be like, okay, whatever. Yeah. 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 Where, so where, I, I, where, where does that come from? Like, what, was it people something? People have asked me that. Yeah. People have asked me that before. And I'm going to take it on three levels. I'm going to go culturally and I'm going to say, I'm a Gen Xer. Okay. We were 30 when we were 10, right? We were mm. like, you know, managing stuff on our own. We were, you know, they joke about drinking out of the, out of the, the, um, the hose. hose. Why would we do that? Well, cause that's the only way we were allowed to drink. I wouldn't go that far, but I mean, we were latchkey kids. I was, you know, single parent raised the whole nine yards. Mm. And so there yeah. was this level of parentification as they call it in, you know, therapy circles now where I was, um, I was, in a, a culture where you just grew up faster in some ways. Some ways were truncated, but other ways were amplified. Second, when I bring it down to my parental uh, and my family structure, one of the parts of my pain, one of the sources of my pain was also the source of my redemption, which was that being treated as though I was an adult and not being given the parameters that a child would be given gave me this perspective, this more grown perspective, because I was on the same level as my parents in a lot of respects. Yeah. And I think, you know, so that's like the so societal, then there's familial, and then there's me. I don't know, like, I, I think some people, whether it was the, the types of trauma, or, you know, maybe there's something that is organically different in our brains and the way they're constructed. I don't think I'm all that special. I think it was just a confluence of, of 
outside and inside impacts. And, you know, I say this in one of the models that I um, have and what we're going to talk about is unflappable is this uh, orientation about the balance of compassion and accountability. Um, and what compassion and accountability, that balance says is that you cannot have one without the other and be operating at your best uh, in, in any relationship or, or you know, program. And so, but compassion says, of course, compassion says you are exactly where you are as a direct and predictable result of every experience you've had and every decision you've made. So you are exactly where one would expect you to be based on your experiences and decisions to this point. So of course, so a lot of my clients will come to me and say, I can't believe so-and-so did this thing. And I say, well, I could have written that script out because I knew exactly what they would do. Because if you look at who they are, what decisions they've made, where they've come from, you can predict their behavior more often than not because they it, that's how they come to it. Accountability says, now what? Okay, now what? And I think that that same framework is, um, I think, a lot of us who have been through, I mean, we've all been through stuff, right? It's, you know, whatever the categories and the ages and things are. But we come to this point where when we can face the idea of holding accountability, of saying, of course, I would feel like this, of course, I'd be struggling, of course, I'd be angry, frustrated, hurt, sad, scared, whatever. But now what? When we mm. hold those two things simultaneously, we're able to move and take the, the gifts and the troubles that are handed to us in those moments and make something positive out of them and change then every future moment. Because again, if we are exactly where we are as a direct and predictable result of every decision we've made and experience we've had, then that means that our experiences and our decisions going forward will necessarily change our future. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's dive into the questions, right. and I'm sure we'll get more into what you just outlined uh, as we talk <laughs> about your new book. Yeah. So for those who may not have listened to the previous episode, yeah. episode 24, re remember, when you're done with this one, go listen to that one. Yeah. Um, because, Bridget, I don't know if I, I think I might have told you, um, somebody had reached out about listening to that episode, had their own brain trauma, and yeah. cried, cried in listening to your story on that yeah. one. Um, yeah. So that to me is amazing just because when somebody feels that emotion, something's yeah. resonating with them. Right. Maybe, right. you know, something that you said, the tone that you use, the words that yeah. you used, somebody going through that experience doesn't have many people that they can talk to about what that feels like. Right. Um, it's invisible. Yeah. It's yeah, it's it's invisible. Yeah. Um so no, I, I appreciate the story you you shared. I'm I'm sure it'll be mentioned here, but sorry, let me get started. Yeah. <laughs> so for those that don't know, you haven't heard the other episode. Yeah. Who are you today? Can you just provide a little breakdown of the work that you're doing with the clients that you work with? I appreciate that, John. Yeah. So I I have built this business over the last 20 plus years of doing a combination of coaching, training, consulting strategic planning sessions, keynotes and workshops, basically helping people learn kind of where they begin and end in conflicts and, and struggles and goal acquisition, et cetera, figuring out where other people do and trying to figure out how to work better with one another and with themselves, right? Kind of, I, you know, I, this latest book is really cleaning up the head trash that a lot of us have around who we are, who other people are, so that we can dial back some of that stress and drama and conflict that plagues our, our very existence. And I've been doing this, again, for about a little over 20 years. And I am absolutely passionate about every client that I have. They come to me with sometimes very clear um, descriptions of what is wrong. And other times they just know something's off, whether it's a corporate client or, or a, an individual client and helping them to go back when we start off this call, figure out what their mission is, figure out that, that mission focused direction for their team, for their company, for themselves uh, really helps them move forward in whatever they're doing. So, uh, you know, and people have called me an author. Yeah, I guess I'm an author. I've, you know, this is my seventh book, but I never set out to write books. I just, I knew I needed one to do all the keynotes and have something in the back of the room and put something out for people who might not work directly with me, but wanted the, you know, to benefit from some of the experiences and, and you know, um, advice that I'd offered. 
And then they just kept adding on and on and on. You know, somebody would say, you know, you should write a book about, you know, you should write a book about, you know, you should write a book about. And I'm very, I'm very, I was very impressionable. So I did the first five books in three and a half years. And then I took a bit of a hiatus and then came back and in 2020, you know, we talked in 2022 about Pain Rebel. And this latest book is really, I, you called it a toolkit at the top of the, the show. That's really what it is. Over the 20 years I've been working with, you know, thousands of people, um, tens of thousands of people um, around the world, I have cultivated through workshopping and or just knowing what's worked in my own career and watching other people and what works in their career and workshopping these tools. I have like a hundred plus tools that I use with clients, frameworks, you know, ways of looking at the world just a little bit differently, other people, quick tips that will shift your focus away from whatever's stressing you out or angering you, that sort of thing. And so I just took them, the 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 best of them, and I put them in this book. So there's about, I combined some into sections so that there's a little easier readability of them, but there's probably close to 75, 80 tools in the book. And it really will help people be able to consult something and say, I'm having this problem with other people. How can I fix this? And then look and see what that looks like. So. Awesome. Yeah. Um, now to understand how you ended up here, can you give me a walkthrough? <laughs> um, well, start, yeah, starting well, whatever the first steps, <laughs> whatever the first steps were into your career, um, you know, past school, what was it? What were those yeah. those steps to begin that career journey to here? Yeah. It's so it's so interesting. So I call myself Goldilocks and not just because I'm blonde, uh, but because when I started off, I went into my undergrad was with a concentration in human resources management because I wanted to help people, but I wanted to work in business. I got into that and I thought, this really isn't what I envisioned. I'm like processing payroll. I'm overseeing hiring and firing. Like I'm not this isn't OD. I didn't know what OD was then. OD mm -hmm. wasn't as elevated as it is now and commonplace to talk about. So I was like, no, I want more OD. And then I decided, you know what I really want? I want to do like therapy. Maybe that's what it is. Like, so that was too cold. Let me go into therapy. So I got my master's in marriage and family therapy. And then I was, I thought, mm, this is a little too much, right? Yeah. You know, we we're, I was dealing with at the time, a state population, addiction services, way too close to home, a lot of tragedy, a lot of trauma. And I thought, I don't know that I can do this forever. Like this seems like a lot. So I went back and I ended up getting my doctorate in educational leadership and doing leadership oriented work, which really combined the human resources side of the things that I've been doing and the therapy and counseling side of understanding kind of how teams work, how groups work, how people work within systems, and combining those two into a more of a leadership focused career. And then I started my own business, um, like I said, about 20 years ago, and have been doing this work ever since. When you think about your childhood, um, <laughs> Does it make sense that this is what you're doing? It's funny you ask that. So I actually picked up a book. I don't even know how long ago it was, maybe like 15 years ago. I was going through some old stuff that I had from childhood. And when I was the, at the ripe old age of, I think, 13, uh, I went to a summer camp program and it was more like college -y, So we took classes and one of the classes was write your own autobiography. Now, if any of you have a 13 year old out there, right, you can understand how many stories a 13 year old have, has and how much they could really write an autobiography. Ha ha. Right. <laughs> they do. But yeah, I had yeah. all these stories. I thought I knew who I was, I, you know, whatever. And I wrote all these cute stories, these quips about, you know, the precocious nature and the mess ups I'd had and other things. And in the back, it's it had an about the author section. And it said that uh, when I grow, when when she grows up, she's going to be a stay at home mom and a part time psychologist. Hmm. And I this was years into my career. And I looked at it and I was I thought, Oh my goodness, like I actually ended up exactly where I thought I would. I just didn't know the words around it. I didn't know what a coach was. I didn't know organizational development. I didn't understand, you know, keynote speeches and whatever. But I wanted to help people with their problems and I wanted my kids to come first. And I was able to create a business and a career with those two things being my primary values, my 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 north stars. And so that's to me it makes sense because 
I wanted to repair everything that was going on in my family. I wanted to repair and help mm. all of the people out of their pain, out of their self-defeating cycles of storytelling about how terrible things were, how awful other people were, to get out of that victim stance, because that would have made my life better. And I didn't have the agency, mm. the ability to do that. So as an adult, I thought, you know what? If I can do that for even a handful of people in this world, it's a domino effect. And I'll have made someone else's life easier than mine was. Yeah. That's what I was thinking when you were talking about compassion, then accountability. Yeah. Like, okay, it's <laughs> it's okay that something and I and I was gonna say that word victim, victim, yeah. help, victimhood, because it's okay that something happened, but don't yeah. sit there, don't stay there, don't stew there, don't right. suffer there. And it's funny because a lot of people think like, oh, but then that lets them off the hook. Like I I know I did this. I wore my badge of honor of suffering and victimhood for so many, like way too many years, right? Because it was the thing that um, told me that it happened and that it was worthy of attention, right? And, and it blocked me from engaging too deeply with the people who had hurt me, right? Because I had this wall of anger up. And only when I realized that whatever had happened and repeatedly it happened, it wasn't like a one-time event, right? Repeatedly it happened. When I was sitting in victim mode one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years later, those events had disappeared. Those unchangeable moments were so far in my rearview mirror, but I was holding the suffering in real time. And what I learned later about our brains, John, is that our brains don't know the difference, don't understand time zones. So when mm. we recreate a moment that has happened in the past, our central nervous system starts oh, yeah. the entire process over <laughs> as though it's yeah. actually happening in the moment. Same thing with rehearsing things going forward, right? So every time I brought back to mind how terribly I'd been treated, how awfully I'd been abused, I was activating that same trauma response over and over and over again. And I, I, there came a moment when I was like, no more, how dare they, that event, that moment, take away one more minute of my life. Mm. It took all those moments before, I can't get those back, but I can get back today and I can get back tomorrow. So there's this, it doesn't need to come necessarily from this gentle Buddhist place <laughs> of like, I just, I let it go. You can also get yeah. mad and say, I will not let those bad things that happened to me steal my joy now. How dare they try, right? right. And that rebelliousness, <laughs> right, is like sometimes that's the energy that somebody needs to come at it with and do your thing. Yeah, yeah I like how you say it doesn't have to come from this peaceful place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necess necessarily because no. everybody's going to be different. Everybody's right. going to have a different ability. Uh, different history. So everybody's going to approach it differently. Sure. But I love that you clarify, it doesn't have to look like you're being the bigger person and all right. is forgiven and right. all is forgotten, that yeah. it doesn't have to look that way. Mm -mm. But you can, whatever, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, no, you can just be like, I will or not pissed. give you. Or pissed. Yeah. And, and I think part of it is not allowing the getting pissed and, and absorbing too much of that hit on yourself, like that guilt of, oh, now I feel badly that I've been so angry for so long. But recognizing, again, we, a compassion, we are exactly where we are as a direct result of all the experiences and decisions we've made. And if you've made a decision to hold on to it for all this time, of course, you would feel like that. Of course, all those things would happen. But getting angry enough to say no more. Like yeah. getting that strong no to come out of like your your bones yeah. can be enough to say, I I'm leaving this situation, whether it's a terrible abusive boss or it's a, a you know, a, a family member or a friend or whatever it is. It doesn't need to be cut off, but you can get real clear that enough's enough. Yeah. And uh and yeah, move forward. Yeah, it's almost like you have to get primal. Not violent. Yeah. Not violent, but primal where, you know, your body's taking all of this in and, and right. you know, we're in civil society. So obviously we're taught to to keep some kind of decorum and right. some kind of composure. But at the same time, I mean, that's not the way that we're programmed. 
No, that's where you boxing know, comes in. <laughs> I was gonna I, I was gonna say I forgot that you had mentioned that previously about the boxing, but I, yeah, mm -hmm. I was gonna say or taking some kind of martial art, just physically getting that energy out of you. There's so much. I actually do um, a, a technique with my uh, clients when they are feeling angry or or anxious, like they're feeling their central yeah, nervous system yeah. is in fight or flight. Yeah. Is to actually do this, the shaking mm. of the hands, like you're trying to dry your hands without a dryer. Yeah. And just doing that actually does trigger to the brain to let that go and to dial that back. Yeah. 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 I, uh, yeah, I believe that because I've said even from my anxiety that I've learned, it's always going to be there. I'm not yeah. coping with it because I don't think it's something foreign. I just think it's something that's programmed into our DNA. Um, so yeah. for me, it's just living with it. It's just determining when I get that sensation, what is it yeah. like for me? So I need to burn it off somehow. So is that, is it my spirituality? Is it the physical? Is the emotional? Right. Is it the intellectual? What is it that I need in a moment where I can burn that off? Right. Because I, I do think like yeah. if you're too stagnant, it just kind of builds up and it burns inside you that you have yeah. to burn it off somehow. So I yeah. love that you bring up just that physicality in boxing or whatever technique of moving and getting that energy out of you instead of it just festering within you. Right. Because that doesn't do anybody any good, right? No, you know, we're just ticking all. time bombs, you know, waiting to go off. Absolutely. And exactly. To respond to like, you know, what's that quote? Uh, you're going to bleed on someone who didn't cut you. Yeah. I mean, that paints a picture. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, <laughs> you know, you're going to project that onto somebody that was nowhere near in time or space that event right. that happened to you. Um, yep, Bridget, sure. can you share what it is that happened to you, if that's okay, just oh, even yeah, in sure. general? Yeah, you know, um, in my uh, TED Talk, and it is, uh, it's a rough TED Talk to watch. It's not one of those easily shareable ones. Um, but I talk about the fact that, you know, the abuse started when with my dad uh, being physically abusive, when I was eight weeks old, uh, was the first time that he hit me until I was until I bled. And until and after that, there was a lot of physical and sexual violence in the house until my mother uh, moved us out of there when I was like, and got me away from him when I was about three and a half. And then there were other things that you can imagine when someone's been conditioned like that, primed like that for that sort of violation. Um, I didn't know where I began and ended. I was at the service of whoever was paying me attention or asking me to do something. So there was a litany of men who did all sorts of things who had any kind of access to me over those years. And, you know, the relationship with my dad and with my mom, they were both addicts, you know, all of that kind of compiled. And then I just started making some really crappy decisions about some of the people that I was in relationship with, even as an adult, because I had what I, you know, and I talk about it in Pain Rebel and also in Unflappable, is this idea of contracts. I had these, these agreements that I had formed in my head that this is how I am. This is how I operate in the world. This is how other people are. This is what I deserve this is what I should be doing. And I lived by those contracts until I examined them and realized what BS they were, that they were contrived when I didn't even understand what I was agreeing to. And they made absolutely no sense. I would never recommend them to anyone I knew, let alone myself. And then I ripped them up. And I, you know, like I cannot be in relationships with people who X, Y, Z, you know, like yeah. I, I require these things to have proximity to me. And instead of doing it with anger, doing it with just a sense of, of clarity that that's just, that's just how I have to be. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, yeah. Just cause I, I think it helps someone understand the extent to what your experience and how it yeah. led to who you are today, like what yeah. you're trying to help other people with. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I, and I, we all have like, you know, pieces and I know I've had clients who have had far, if we can put them on some spectrum, I don't even know if we can do it, but you know, worse <laughs> experiences or not as bad experiences, but it doesn't matter. Trauma is an interruption of mm. what we were put here to experience. Like how, how we were formed was to you know, see only beauty, feel only inclusion, have only love. Like that was what it was supposed to be like. And anything shy of that left some marks, whether they, we transformed them and transmuted them or whether we didn't. So, you know, I hope that your listeners, whether they had any kind of history that looks like mine or doesn't just yeah. recognize that it doesn't need to be big or it could be even bigger. And it's still going to 
it, it affects how we see things and not because we're wrong or bad, but because until we challenge the programming, we can't readjust. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that is key for people to understand that, um, You've mentioned that before, that trauma is trauma. There is a severity to it. Um, but I think people need to understand that there are disruptions in their youth that they don't, yeah. they wouldn't particularly label as trauma. Right. I wasn't abused. It wasn't violent. Like it wasn't affect me. It didn't affect me physically, but you can still have trauma without that. Right. Uh, but I love that you clarify that, especially with somebody, as somebody who's gone through that experience yourself, yes. that it doesn't have to look like this to kind of, change your course for the worse or make it more challenging for you. So I Correct. appreciate that. And we don't need to hate our parents about it. Right. Like, I mean, I, you know, I have my feelings about my own parents behavior, right. Somewhat harsh and somewhat forgiving, but we don't need to turn that and then make our parents terrible if we suffered at their hands, because I, I've done this in workshops. I've said, you know, so let me look around the room. So any of you who have siblings, raise your hand. Okay. Those of you who have siblings, raise your hand if you, how you talk about your childhood is different than how your sibling talks about your childhood. And almost every hand goes up, right? Because we all come into these moments and what worked for one kid doesn't work for another, right? What message one picks up from what a parent said or did isn't the message that the another one picked up, right? And so they, we have a lot of, I think in our society today, a lot of, um, you know, parent blaming for every single problem that happened. And it's not to excuse really poor behavior, but it's to clarify what the <clears throat> intention over impact, right? And some of what that might look like, those nuances that might help people be Oof. more clear, you know? <clears throat> you know, as a That's... father of three, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's tricky. You know, yeah. somebody can say, you know, this is what parenthood's going to look like, get your sleep, this and that. But when you have these lives in your hands and you have your, your outside stressors chipping yeah. at you and then, each of them needs something and this one's having a, a break that like, right. and you can already see what's interesting about what you say about, okay, I gained things from my environment, but I was always that person that kind of picked yes. myself up on my bootstrap, all that stuff. Um, you can see each of them is affected by what's in the environment for better or worse. Yeah. And at the same time, they're their own personalities. Yes. So, you know, you're trying to preserve like the good things and not, not lose those too quickly. Right. Um, just enough challenge to make them have a really good sense of humor, you know? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, talking about how we're Gen X, right. the way my wife and I raise our kids where obviously we want to take care of them completely, Yeah. but we don't, we're not helicopter parents. No. Cause I want, I want them to face adversity when they're yes. around me. Right. In a, in a controlled environment so that they're not thinking that the outside world, it's like, I tell my son, like when I discipline him or talk to him, you know, sternly about something or take away something he wants just kind of as like a pause. Yeah. I'll talk to him like, you know, face to face. It's yeah. like, buddy, if I don't teach you this and you leave our house when you get older, like the world is going to teach you. Right. And it's not going to teach you in a loving way. So nope. that's a rabbit hole we can go down. Oh, but, yeah. We can talk but about one thing I, I, <laughs> I think that's, I mean, from my experience, just listening to these kind of stories, I think it's huge of you to say, you know, you, you're not, you're not letting your parents off the hook, but yeah. there's a, a different way to think about it. And then you talked about intention versus impact, yeah. which is something that's come up a lot on here. Can you just speak to that? Yeah, yeah. Whether so specifically also, to yeah. this or in general? Yeah. So I also, that's also an unflappable talking about the distinction between intent and impact. So, so many times what gets us riled up, it, you know, it expands conflicts, gets us in all sorts of circles in our mind or, you know, um, melees in our, in, in between people is this idea that we hold people accountable for the impact of their actions with zero consideration for the intent. Mm. And I think that it really is how we have to be mindful. It's not about not holding someone accountable to some extent for the impact, right? And clarifying how that intent was off or whatever. But I think if we could just look at the intent more often, 
we would solve so many more problems and take fewer things personally and be offended less and all of that because we would recognize that the impact for us might be different than the impact for someone else and what sorts it through is the intent. So, you know, if your intention in, you know, you come, you, you come into the office and, you know, you bring like, uh, you know, donuts and coffee for everybody <laughs> because your intention is to tell everyone how much you appreciate them and they've been working long nights and you're really excited. But you have three people in the office who are on a diet who feel overweight and they feel right. So now they feel worse about themselves because they can't participate in the thing. So the impact is negative, but mm. the intent was good. <laughs> and so often we get stuck on, well, they made me feel fat and, yes. you know, whatever. Right. Instead of looking at like, yeah, but what did they mean by that? Because if you can connect <clears> with <throat> someone on that intent, you can clarify the number of options that line up with the intent. So if your intention is this, can you look at what the impact will be from the action that mediates those two things? So it's an intention, there's an action, and then there's an impact, right? So what do we need to modify in the action step to be able to have the intent and, and the impact <clears throat> align? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I asked you to, kind of just expand on that just because over yes. the course of the last couple of years, intention versus impact has been huge. I mean, you've mentioned, yes. you've mentioned um, just now, like not getting offended when you hear something. Yeah. Um, I've seen so many examples where people went into a room with the right intentions, but because they weren't educated enough in the language right. of their intention, yeah. the other side got mad. Right. Like you should have known better. So there's no teaching moment, right? There's nothing. We just shut down communication. There's so much of that happening exactly. in the workplaces right now and in society <laughs> at large of not listening at a deeper level to really understand. Let's look at. And that's what I that's what the whole book is about. It's all my work is about is about trying my my North Star is clarity. I'm looking for clarity. I'm looking for compassion. So I yeah. want to listen to what people are, are thinking and I want to make that clear so that people can get past some of that garbage that happens when we kind of make something out of something like we, we, it's almost like we're in this we have so there's a part of our brain and the um, brainstem that's called the reticular activating system and what it does is it seeks to find what you tell it to find okay so like if you were thinking you know what i want i want a black toyota camry mm. all of a sudden the entire city that you live in is filled <laughs> yeah. with black uh, Toyota Camry. Like, where did they all come from? I don't understand, right? Everybody's got a black Toyota Camry. Well, we know that that statistically isn't true, but we all of a sudden start seeing them everywhere because we put it into our brain that that's what yeah. we want. The same thing happens with a fence. When we, are, when we are oriented toward the world, that the world is out to get us, the world is ignorant, people are stupid, people are, you know, they're, they're you know, coming to annoy me. We are looking for, we are turning on our reticular activating system to like beep, 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 find the offense and then react to it. And if instead we switched our reticular activating system to seek understanding, like I wonder, and I talk about this in the book too, about curiosity over certainty, is to adopt a curiosity mindset to be like, I wonder what that's about. Mm. Because again, I can judge it all I want, but judging it doesn't make it different. If I can get yeah. curious, then I can try to figure out what the problem is and then I can try to solve it. Yeah, that's why like everything you see on TV, the talking heads, I mean, they're going to talk about it from their standpoint. Yes. Yeah. You know, all the all the the different groups that are against each other. That's just, yeah. you know, they're they're they've assigned themselves to this side. That's all they know. They're up against you. And there is right. no there is no aiming to understand. There is no aiming to build a bridge that the trigger of looking for something to get offended by that oh, could be that could right. be an entirely <laughs> different episode like it's just amazing it's it's so it's addictive right it's addictive because what happens is when we get offended again our central nervous system gets hijacked mm -hmm. right and for mm -hmm. some people that ends up feeling like a high oh, like yeah. something they want to yeah. like recreate that like adrenaline rush right that that is just, right it's that goes back to that primitive where you're on the lookout yes. for something your body needs that high your body right. needs that you know i think we're relatively more dormant and stagnant sure. than our our primitive 
ancestors. Yeah. We're, si we're sitting safely in a house. We don't have to yeah. worry about, for the most part, everybody yeah. does. For the most part, not everybody. So now we have to manufacture it. We have now to we have, have to, to okay now i i need yeah. that high my body yeah. needs to chase something fight something off be attacked yeah. by somebody listen go do oh paintball go to a, go to a, a, a maze room right go to something like do a laser tag yeah. like figure out something else but honest to god if i could do anything to shift how people see things um it would be a mixture of obviously the compassion and accountability piece and curiosity but it would be about looking at what is happening as not being a reflection of who you are as the first step. Now, yeah. I, I part ways with the four agreements. Everybody loves talking about the four agreements. Mm -hmm. Anybody who knows me knows I get riled up about the four agreements because of the chapter on take nothing personally. Mm. And I stand apart from that because if you're being a jerk, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Right? I, I love the like, book. I yeah. love the book. Um, I love it too, but you and know I agree what I mean. with that chapter only for the most part. And it's like any like, like anything else, yes, <laughs> like anything else with coaches, right? Um, there right. is gonna be a limit. There you is. know, take the tools we give you, but you know, use some common sense. So yeah, yeah absolutely. I, you I'm, know, I'm with you. You know the people you've run into the people who will do the most jerkish things, right? Like act like absolute, you know, you know what's. And then say, yeah, but I don't take it personally. Like when they react to me like that, I don't take it personally. And that's where I always go, whoa, whoa, whoa wait. First, you yeah. gotta do a thorough moral inventory. <laughs> and then Absolutely. you can say, this is mine. Yes. This is theirs, yes. right? I can look at this. I don't have to take this all in and get offended. I yes. can take it in, look at what's mine, sort that out, and then hand back what's not mine. And that's fair. I like that. If they put that in the four agreements, I would have gone with that. Yeah, I've actually had <laughs> I've actually had somebody like in the past in a conversation. Yeah. Where they said something and, and the wording was off. I'm like, what did you mean by that? And they yeah. were like, ah, oh, don't be sensitive. Like, you, you, it's just your your ego is fragile. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm not. I'm not reacting emotionally. I'm just taking an inventory of what you said, right. you, used, you used a particular word that's kind of shifting the blame towards me. So let's, talk. oh, no, 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 you're just being sensitive. Right. So there's like moments where you really have to think about, yeah, like, yeah. don't take it personally, but right. don't let yourself be walked on. Correct. So it, and I, there has, yeah. to, has to be that common sense. Everything, I would yeah. say for me, hopefully with yours as well, I'm assuming, because I know you well enough, I believe, you want common sense infused yeah. into like the work that you're you're providing for your clients. Um, Correct. Yeah, and I think what it what it comes down to for me is that you you don't want to invent or walk into more anxiety, anger provoking moments than you need to. You have enough. And again, if you want some more, go find a hobby. Right. I don't. That's the thing. I don't think people have enough. I really mm. don't. Just because. You know, not of true ones, you mean? So not they, true ones. Oh, yes, okay. yes. Maybe yeah. manufactured ones. They do, but and I'm not judging. But I, I, I look at some comments on social media, which is like the wrong place to go because you're going <laughs> to yeah. see that all over the place. It's like, yep. like, how do these people have time right. to get offended by this particular thing? Right. Now, if you're if you're protesting against something, standing sure. against something, but yeah. the way that these people spend their time. Mm -hmm. jumping all over some kind of comment or post somebody again right oh that's have a, a whole, whole episode <laughs> that is a few we have a list of like into. five <laughs> topics where we have to just direct one episode let me yeah i love Start that those down. I, I gotta stop <laughs> hijacking this conversation to pick your brain about that but on to the next question what does yeah, leadership please. mean to you how would you describe well, it that's such i was actually thinking about that last night um believe it or not because i was thinking about a lot of the people when i talk about how i work with leaders that they say yeah but i'm not in charge of a department um, and i'm like okay so you're not in charge of a department but who do you lead who do you who models themselves after mm -hmm. you and there are so many people in our lives who lead us in the way of modeling a behavior and sometimes it's like i call it anti-leadership which is yeah i'm going to do anything but that right? Like that person is exactly what I don't want to be. So they're, <laughs> they're working as an anti-leader, right? Away from that, that source. But yeah. it's really mm -hmm. about um, being clear in mission and wanting to bring people from one place to another or hold them in a positive place if you've already kind of arrived 
so that they can build community, they can build wealth, they can build impact. And being able to, however that comes about, you can be a leader as a teacher, you can be a leader as a CEO, you can be a leader as an entrepreneur, you can be a leader as a, a, a grocery store clerk, right? Mm. You, it, it really is about Everybody, modeling. Yeah. yeah, it's about yeah. modeling. And I know we get really picky about like everybody is a leader, but we really are because first and foremost, I hope we're leading ourselves. Mm-hmm. We're leading ourselves with a mission focused orientation toward our worlds. And therefore we bring that to all of the other moments that we find ourselves in. I love that one. Yeah, yeah that's huge. I mean, cause I, I work with a lot of students and they'll have that idea in their head that they aren't a leader. Right. Um, they don't have a department. They don't have, yeah. Because they don't have a right. department. They're not in yeah. charge of anything. But everybody, I've said it, like everybody's always watching or sensing what other mm-hmm. people are doing. Yeah. You know, so we, as we go, we're building profiles of people. What kind of value are they adding? What kind of initiative mm-hmm. are they taking? Not in a mission, not in work, but just in every day. How yeah. are they treating people? How right. are they saying please and thank you? Like, that's the kind of thing where you can make a difference just in the everyday with those small little gestures. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So at this point, we typically jump into the book. All but right. But before we jump into <laughs> we, that book. We've kind of been in the book in and out. I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, before we jump into the book we're going to cover here on Flappable, can yeah. you just give a rundown of- There it is. I, yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Can you give a rundown of your previous books? Sure. Nothing so, in depth, just kind of yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. a brief thing, but thing. also what what was the path that kind of led you from one into the next? Yeah, absolutely. Well? So uh, the first book was Feed the Need, and it was on how to understand conflict differently so that you could achieve goals and have smoother relationships. It was my kind of my platform book, and I did it in order to, again, have something in Print and also to be able to have something at the back of the room. And I was doing all the keynotes and workshops I was doing. Feed the Need Teen Edition came next and not because I intended it to. I was doing a workshop and a young woman came up and said, hey, I just wanted to let you know, because I was doing it on Feed the Need. And she said, I just wanted to let you know that you changed my life tonight. I've, been ha- I've had a bully at school and I now know what to do when I go back into school to like hold, my- hold myself together. And uh, she said, and um, do you have this in teen edition? And I thought, I'm such an idiot. Like, why don't I have this in teen edition? I needed this book when I was a teen. Why didn't Mm. I write it for teenagers, right? Like I could have, I could have avoided so many problems if I'd read it when I was a teenager. So anyway, um, I said, you're brilliant. So I went back and I re just, I, I took the first book and I just kind of hashed it out a little bit differently with a little more teen language and examples. And then I had that young woman write the foreword. So awesome. teen, Feed the Need Teen Edition came out. And then the third one was, um, I called Stuck You, like university and also play on words. And uh, it's about the change process because I was doing a lot of change leadership work with our organizations at that time. And I wanted to give a manual really to the people who were either on their own change journey or in the journey with the co- corporation to understand what that was going to require of them. So there's a five-step change process that I use with clients and that's in there. And then the fourth one, I, it came about because of the number of clients that I was working with who kept coming up with the same pain points in their organizations and their cultures, and they were stress, drama, and isolation. So I did a deep dive into how stress, drama, and isolation can eat away at the fabric of an organization and how to mitigate those influences. And then came, uh, finally, I say finally, because it had been the original book that my grandmother many years ago told me I had to write, which is the story of my life. And it was a a, a brief um, synopsis of it, of, you know, kind of the bucket of my birth to 18 years old when I made that kind of trajectory different for myself. Um, And the back of the book is very different because instead of just being a um, kind of a autobiography, it's Mm -hmm. really based in how do, if your life looked like this, or you have some pain that, you know, replicates or mirrors mine, how do you move out of it? So it's like a recovery manual in the back third of the just book. Just so people know the title of that one. Oh, I'm sorry. Little Landslides. Sorry. So okay. Power Play was the fourth one. Stuck You, then Power Play, then uh, Little Landslides. And then the sixth book that you and I talked about um, at the last episode was Pain Rebel, uh, which is really that we have as a, as a culture, especially, but as just a, a, a race, you know, the human race, 
we have a broken relationship to pain. We see pain very differently than how it should be used in order for us to rise and move through things and take the lessons and go on to the next part of our journey. So it's really looking at pain differently and all of the tools that are required to move into that different mindset. And then of course, number seven is unflappable. <laughs> Bridget, for anybody that hasn't listened to the other episode yet, can you share a little bit about your accident and where oh, that was yeah. Just because, so, I mean, just from knowing you that pay, it plays a big part in who you are. I mean, yes. you've been who you've been since 18, you had this <laughs> wisdom about you. But there's right. something about obviously that pivotal point in your life that yeah. kind of changed that trajectory. It did. Yeah. So five years ago, August 31st, 2018, uh, coming home from dinner with a friend, celebrating a trip I'd just taken to Ireland with my daughters. I had my daughters were going into their uh, sophomore and senior years in high school, respectively, and um, went through an intersection and a driver for hire blew the red going about 40 miles an hour from what they could um figure out, uh, slammed into my side of the SUV I was in and flipped us, sent us up the road. Um, and I suffered a traumatic brain injury as a result. And so I have an auditory and uh, visual processing disorders. I'm constantly, you notice me on the episode, I'm sipping you know, my drink uh, pretty constantly. I'm constantly nauseous from the time I wake up in the morning to the time I go to bed. Um, I wear hearing aids to try to help me with the tinnitus and, uh, but I hear differently out of both ears. I see differently out of both eyes. The world is kind of constantly moving. So I'm constantly dizzy and, uh, and I have worked on it, but I have memory issues. So my IQ dropped, they did two different uh, tests on it and it was between 18 and 25 points, um, that I lost in IQ and it was on, not on analytical or verbal ability, but on recall and processing speed. And I've worked really hard to mask a lot of that and a lot of the ways that I communicate and prepare for things. Um, but it is a, it's a constant struggle. It's a constant struggle to kind of stay above water with all of that. And, um, and to that listener who had, who had had that emotional response to, you know, the brain injury, it's an invisible illness. And I have, I have gathered so much compassion for people who have chronic and invisible illnesses, because the thing about an invisible illness is like, for example, I, you know, I talk to people and they don't know that I have this, right? They don't know that I'm struggling. They don't know how much energy it takes me to come to every conversation and to kind of get up in the morning and, you know, kind of move through my day. So when I, sh in order for them to know, I have to tell them, which means that I have to then talk about something that I hate to even focus on, right? And then because we are cultured to make people feel better, I get a lot of, oh yeah, I'm like that too. Oh yeah, I forget things. Oh yeah, you know, that's just middle age. Oh yeah, right? And they're not meaning anything negative by it, right? They're trying to have me like feel okay and better and more normal about it. But what it does for people who have those kinds of either chronic pain or other illnesses is it makes them feel even more invisible and mm -hmm. having to talk about it in order to be visible, which is, you know, one of the tips I gave to um, some friends of mine a few years ago, and it's really helped is stop asking me how I feel. Because how, again, this is talking about intent versus impact, right? So the intent of someone asking you how you feel when you have a chronic illness is to let them know that they're thinking about them. You know, like, I care, I want you to feel better. I, are you feeling any better? I'd love to hear that, right? The impact, at least for me and for a lot of people with chronic illnesses that I've spoken to, is that it then makes us have to talk about how badly we feel, right? And so I, I've said to my friends, listen, if I feel better, you will know. I will be yelling from the rooftops that all of a sudden or, you know, in small steps, I feel better. You will know. Um, instead, how about just say, I know it was hard to get here today. I can imagine it was hard to get here today. I just really want to thank you for showing up, right? Or I really want to, I appreciate the time that you devoted to this because I know it, you know, these, these moments aren't easy for you. Just, and if I- Yeah, if it, that works. Right? That's okay. Does That's that work? Okay. It yeah. still works because here's the thing then I know that they see me and I know that my efforts are appreciated because the upward climb for those yeah. of us who are struggling with chronic illness is immense, right? 
And you can, and here's the thing, John, it's not a one size fits all. We talked about the rage versus the, you know, the, the Buddha, right? Like mm -hmm. approaches. This may not be for hundred percent of the people who are listening, right? Who have a chronic illness. They might be like, I would take offense to that. I don't want to hear that. You know what? Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. Then that's why, that's why I said that because I can imagine some people saying that it sounds like it's like uh patronizing or like coddling, maybe. but. But Here's the thing. Yeah. Each intent. person has their own thing. Right. And if you are in relationship with people who you think would be patronizing to you, then you need to do a check. Mm. And here's the, like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I oh, think part of, this, <laughs> part of this is, is looking at who are you, if you are the person who is in a relationship with someone who's chronically ill, ask them, ask yeah. them what they need from you. How can I best support you? How can I best love you? How can I best befriend you? How can I best work with you? Right? Like how, what do you need yeah. from me to get the best from you and let them tell you versus assuming that you know, and then operating off of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point to bring up just that everybody's going through a different thing. If they're yeah. going through the same thing, they react differently. If they react differently, maybe they want to hear different um, right. inquiries about their health and how they're doing. But I think, yeah, we, we, we walk on eggshells and then we try to do what we think is right. <laughs> and we don't want to bring up, what is it you need? How should I put this to you? Like that conversation yeah. may be comfortable, but it's like, do it once, get it oh, out of the way. So yeah. you have like a, a code for how to kind of interact going forward. Right. But I, I mean, how relieved are you? you? Uh, how relieved are you when someone actually asks you a direct question versus guessing and trying to figure it out? Right. Yeah. Even like, that's one of those, again, intention versus impact. You're trying to yeah. do the right thing, but uh, it's just, a, it can be, you know, a, a minefield yeah. just because we're just all so different. Yeah. But, but we can't take doubt, responsibility. Yeah. You can't take but responsibility yeah, when for in someone doubt, else's. Just ask you know. the question, like, how, yeah. I don't know anything about this. How can I best help you? How can I best right. check in with you instead of. Right. It's tricky. It's tricky. Um, it is tricky, but we I can't take responsibility for how other people respond to us. Absolutely. We can take responsibility for our intent, intention, mm. and we can take responsibility for addressing an, uh, an unintentional impact, right? We, yeah. But to try to figure out both sides of the relationship all the time, stop exhausting yourself, right? Because, yeah. you know, I'm my job is take care of me. So if you come to me and you say something that upsets me, I'm gonna let you know. And then we're gonna yeah, work through, I, right? <laughs> you know, like- You and I are very similar. Um, another guest, Connor Delaney and I are very similar in that because yep. uh, the book Radical Candor came up in that yeah. conversation with, with uh, Connor where it's kind of like, I just say what's on my mind. Yeah. Not to be rude. I'll try to do it with tact, with some cooth, but I don't like wasting anybody's time. Right. I want to get to what I need. I want to get to what you need. If 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 I feel like there's something that we need to sort out to move better forward, right. I'd rather do, do that it. than kind of play that guessing game for you know <laughs> weeks and months and years, whatever it may be. So I like that you're a straight shooter. I appreciate it. Oh, that. yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, okay, so unflappable. Yeah. Now we can yes. dive into that. Please, the lead up to the book, what was it that kind of, you gave points along the way of our conversation yeah, yeah, about today. The book itself, but yeah. But how so, did the, what was it that, that led you to write this particular book? It, it was a, it was a duh, what I call a duh moment, like what an idiot I am moment. So I was doing a series of workshops for a client up in New Hampshire, state of New Hampshire agency. And I had a number of people come up to me after the workshops were over and ask me, which book should I buy? Which book has all this stuff in it? This was so easy, so helpful, so good. And I looked at them and I thought, I don't have all this stuff in one book, right? I had been pulling from different books and I had had things that weren't in any books because they just didn't mm. line up with the overall purpose of the book. So they just, the tools didn't make it in there. And I drove home the entire, like whatever, two and a half hour drive home going, you are such a fool. Why do you not have one book where all your stuff can be found? Like, why does somebody have to pick between six books? Like, stop it already, right? So I went home and I started looking for all my tools. Like how many tools do I have? Could I make a book out of it? Like, what could I do? And John, I didn't even hit a couple of the books and I had like 80 tools. And I went, oh, I didn't know I had that many. That's kind of cool. So I just pulled them together. I organized them. I, you know, rewrote a lot of them. I, you know, added examples and, and activities yeah. and things like that. And, um, and yeah, and put them into one place in order to help people navigate stress 
uh, that inner voice or inner kind of dynamics that they have with themselves that lead to conflict and also the stress that comes when they're in interpersonal conflict. So it, it hits those three areas in real simple couple of pages, a tool way to go ahead and get through some of those things equipped with more insight and perspective. Yeah. So the book is Unflappable, How Smart People Quit Overthinking, Ditch the Drama and Thrive at Work. You got it. And I mentioned that only because what you just said, what you just spoke about was about the person. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, they're, yeah. They're, it's like the personal work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Cause I think leaders, like whoever you are as a person, whoever you are outside is going to bleed into what your leadership yeah. is. The more peace right. or the more turbulence you have at home or outside in the personal, somehow it's going to rear its ugly head or for better or worse in the workplace. So I like that you bring up that it is that personal work. It is. It does I mean, impact. It's, yeah, it's got the whole book is on how <clears throat> we do these things at work, but it's not for nothing what you said, which is that if you've got head trash in your head at home, you've got it at work and vice versa. That you're not. You know, I I don't know of anyone who like snaps into some different human when they walk out or inside the door. And now that most people are, so many people are working from home, they don't even yeah. have that transition moment, right? So. This is working at the human level, but it's that's a very this, good point with yeah, the remote working now. Like right? you're now, There's even no if you did take it to work, there is yeah. no separation. You couldn't None. be away from not saying home life is toxic or tricky, but you know, there are be. stressors. It yeah. can be, it can be. Yeah. I'm just saying not all, right. uh, but everybody has their their stressors, whatever they may be. So it's interesting Correct. that yeah, I mean, before it's like unfortunately back in the day when somebody would be bullied at school yeah. and then they'd go home, they would have that separation. You know, right. now it's a different world, but there is that mm -hmm. separation of space that gives you a breather. But even if you're the only one that's home and it is a stressful environment, just yeah. being there, all that energy is just trapped between those walls. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I've worked with a lot of clients, a lot of companies, organizations who are looking to support their staff who are often all remote or part remote or just distanced, right? They're in multiple locations and trying to create teamwork and a sense of identity. And so much of that has to do with what you're talking about is them understanding how them working remotely from their homes is can impact how it is that they're coming to the workplace and what they do with that stuff because it's the bleed factor is so heavy now. Yeah. yeah. So how do you... How did you organize the book then? Is there is it broken up in sections with yep. a couple of tools in each? Like, how did you go? What was your thought process in organizing it for the reader and the journey yeah. that you were going to take them on? So I had, as as creative people do, or when people are creating things, I had a lot of different ideas about it. Um, it ended up with me doing it in four main buckets. And the first bucket is foundations, which is basically okay, everybody, here's how I look at the world. This is my framework on kind of how the world, how people work, how stress works, how the brain works. Like if you don't agree with this, if you don't see how this works, none of these other tools are going to have a foundation for you, right? You're not going to under, I'm not going to be able to call back to this information effectively. So I put a section in there, a short section on foundations. And then I move right into stress busters, which are techniques that are uh, help you bust, you know, remove, reduce, avoid a lot of the stress and understanding stress <clears throat> differently. And so each of the tools, again, are just a couple of pages long. Some might be three, but that's probably about the max. And then I move into intrapersonal skills. I break up the last two sections into intra and inter. Intra meaning things that are going on inside your own head that are affecting how you feel about either you and or other people. It's kind of like what you bring to the fight, what you're bringing to the moment and how you can correct some of that stuff so that you're clear, you're strong, you're managing your own kind of um, you know cadence. And then interpersonal skills is like those intervention pieces of how do you deal with other people? How do you deal with somebody who's being difficult? How do you deal with uh, a moment with this super high stress and tension? How do you move through those pieces? And so it's broken up really clearly, simply into those buckets. And then in the back, there's a listing for those of uh, my readers or clients who have heard some of my tools. I have clients who have their like their top five favorite tools. You can go in the back and look up alphabetically what those tools are and where to find them in the book. 
Awesome. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to give just a few examples, maybe two examples of? Two, I, well, just I a, gave a, you so many with compassion and accountability and curiosity versus certainty and intent versus impact. But you're see, I didn't realize how many. See, I'll give you. I'll give you. I'll, I, I, there were probably more, but I have short-term memory issues, so who knows? Oh, and contracts. We talked about contracts. Oh my God, you're right. See, I gave hey, listen, you were talking so about that many. stuff in plain language. How was I supposed <laughs> to know that they were the actual? That's what I'm saying. That's what that's like. That's the, the beauty of I, listen. I, I joke about this when I do presentations. My mother was a um, finance and accounting major. My sister was a math major, like super smart with numbers. Not me. I'm, I'm smart with other things. But I have to keep things simple in my mind. They have to have two, three, four, maybe five steps. They go beyond that. They get too complex. I can't tackle yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. So I do the same thing with my tools. They are so simple. They're so they're deep. They'll hit you sometimes in the solar plexus, but they are so simple to shift your thinking about something, right? To like understand what it is that you've been doing all this time that hasn't worked well for you, right? Like, so one, I just, I'm, I just flipped through the book. I'm like, okay, yeah, what sure, haven't sure, I shared sure. with them? So I'll, I'll share this one. One of them is, and this is about, this is one of the interpersonal skill builders, is popping into observer mo mode. So, so many times we think that we are a player in an interaction, right? We are, it's us against them. We've got to prove a point. Mm -hmm. We've got to get this thing across the finish line. We've got to do this, right? And that may be true, right? There are roles that we all take in a, in a, a conflict. But if we can pop into either in the moment is so powerful or after or before the moment, secondarily powerful, observer mode. Mm -hmm. which is to detach emotionally from what is happening in the moment and pull back that, you know, five, 10,000 feet to be able to look and go, what are we doing here? Like mm -hmm. what's happening? Okay. So I'm getting emotional. Oh, okay. I'm, my voice is, ra is, is rising. Okay. I need to turn that down. They're, they seem to be triggered off when I say that word, right? Okay, I need to not use that word. I'm noticing that every time I say something, they say this other thing. Okay, right? And getting into that observer mode can help you get your ego out of the fight because so many of our problems, it's not that we mm. are, shouldn't have an ego. We all have an ego. Every one of oh, us yeah, has absolutely. an ego, right? It serves it's us. That, right. It serves us until it doesn't. Yes. Which is when we have an ego and it's about the ego winning versus the initiative succeeding yes. or versus the company or versus the, you know, the relationship being healthy. That's when we need to set that thing down. We need to go, okay. Absolutely. I hear you. I feel you. This is troubling. This is upsetting. You're going to need to set aside for a minute. So observer mode is like that power tool of being able to shift into observer mode and be able to be detached from that immediate conflict so that you can use the front of your brain, you know, your prefrontal cortex, yep, or actually, higher you know, higher brain where things are, you can actually analyze things and problem solve better. And so that reptilian brain, where you're just trying to survive yeah. the moment. And say, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, right, exactly. But that is yeah. like popping. So doing something as simple as going, I'm going to go into observer mode and imagining mm. yourself going into observer mode is what your central nervous system needs to, to calm and to be able to stop the flooding of cortisol and adrenaline, to be able to listen, to be able to seek oxytocin and, you know, and, and serotonin from that connection and that respect and that joining and be able to resolve the conflict that's in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of, yeah. that's one of my go-tos. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny. I used to do, or I wrote something about something like that, similar to that, just, it's funny how we we both speak about like stepping back. Yeah. I was kind of just breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. Like pretend you're watching a play. You know who the players are. You know, you know, their personalities. Like mm -hmm. you can watch when certain people are doing certain things. So yeah, it's just that emotional intelligence of just stepping back. Right. And knowing and just, that and you can realizing always, like yeah. it's it's not gonna get us anything. No. You know, how often does it really work out to our benefit? Yeah, that yeah maybe yeah. we won momentarily but in the end what did we really get and take away yeah the biggest i don't know about you john but the biggest regrets i have from any personal or professional interaction were when i let my emotions get the better of me and not because they weren't valid not because they weren't right you know but because they didn't serve 
the purpose that I really wanted. They didn't serve that that mission, that overarching mm-hmm. objective to again succeed, have the relationship stay on you know on on track, whatever that was. They didn't help that because they polluted the environment. And again, that's that compassion and accountability, which is yeah. of course I would feel really mad. But what now? What right? Do I really want to take this the bait? Do I really want to jump into this ring? I don't need to be. What's that quote? I don't need to be uh, to um, go to every fight I'm invited to. Right? Like I, oh, I, don't I never need heard to do that, that one. Yeah, I don't. I, I'll, I'll have to find the source for you. But it's basically okay. like, I don't need to. Um, I don't need to enter every fight I'm invited to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so listen, you're right. You gave more examples as we <laughs> talked, so you don't have to give a second example. But if you could, yeah. if you could, why don't you skip around to maybe three or four and just give the title, just to give a, people a sense of what they can find, what else they can find. Oh, I love this. Okay, so you're gonna, I'm gonna send me back to my uh, my index here. My goodness. Um. So all right. So we've got um, uh, control buckets. Uh, we've got the uh, coping versus healing mechanisms. People confuse some of their things that help them get through something to the thing that they need to keep doing to actually heal from it. Not a fact. Mm. Um, derailing the runaway th- thought train and how you do that. Um, uh, appreciating the worst in others. I know that sounds tricky, but I've got a roadmap for that too. Yep. I have a whole section on joy versus fear-based people. I actually had one of my clients was writing a book and putting this section in his book, but it's around uh, looking at people as understanding that what are they motivated by? Are they motivated by seeking opportunity, options, change, choice, and joy, or are they driven by avoiding fear, avoiding risk, avoiding trouble? And when you notice that that's the framework in any conflict, you can at least understand it and extend accountability and compassion to that moment. Um, oh, I love my, I do a whole workshop on this, but meeting hell to meeting well, it's figuring out how to manage those meetings because as since the pandemic, we actually are in meetings 250% more often than we were before the pandemic. So um, I have a whole strategy on trying to reduce and refine that uh, to a more manageable level. And it's amazing when clients show you their calendar. Oh, like how do you get anything done? Right. Like, like at, oh. at night, at night, yeah. it's just wall to wall meetings. Uh, and it's, they can, it's... they complain about the efficiency of those meetings and then they're catching up, you know, as soon as, cause typically yeah. I work with them after work. So then they're like, all right, uh, it was great seeing you again. Now I'm going to go to work and they work till like 10, 11 midnight. It's unsustainable. It is so bad for the human condition to be and working I think in some those people, ways. It's a badge of honor to it say, is. look, look at my calendar. <laughs> right. I'm working all these hours. <laughs> look this at this. What, yeah. Look what I'm doing. Yeah. Like the whole, that whole notion of busy. I'm too busy. Uh, I'm so busy. Yeah, right. And busy yeah. doesn't give value. Biz impact no. gives value. Yeah. Absolutely. Busy does not. And so looking at that from an impact standpoint. So yeah. And I could go on and on. I haven't even hit like M, but yeah. No, no, I appreciate it. <laughs> so I think I asked you the last time we talked about pain rebel in yeah. writing this book, what lessons did you take away or how do you view the material different? What changed you in this yeah. process? That's such a great question. I, um, I know that since the brain injury, and we talked about this uh, during uh, for Pain Rebel, but since the brain injury, I knew that I could, it was a great challenge. I could tackle a book like this because I broke it into its smallest possible denominator. So get, like attacking one tool at a time allowed me to be able to move through the editing and the writing process in a way that was effective. If I had started to write a book from start to finish, like just kind of like as it evolved, I, I used to be able to do some of that. I don't, I, I don't see myself doing that anymore. Um, but what I was, I was very, I was grateful to myself and and just a lot of this healing journey that I reworked the interior of the book several times. So I learned some strategies in my own mind of how I had to manage my time, how I had to manage certain parts of the process, who I had to call in for help to be able to stay on track, to be able to do that reorganization that I, I couldn't do it alone. And I couldn't do it without a real clear intention and plan on how to make it work. Uh, you know, old brain would have been able to just fly with it. That wasn't the case with this one. So that, that yeah. I definitely learned. And 
I also, I think the, the last thing that to me is just really affirming is, you know, again, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been helping people with their problems, you know, since I was whatever, you know, knee high to a grasshopper, but I, um, I, I looked at this, I know I sound so Southern. Um, <laughs> I looked at this book and, and, and realizing how many tools I have, it made me as again, someone who is like, it's been challenging the last five years and kind of like holding on to my, you know, sense of self and, you know, how I feel about all the things I'm still capable of doing of seeing how much stuff I have and how much I have to offer people and how much healing and change and support I can provide just in them having a copy of this book. And that, that was really incredibly rewarding to me to be able to feel like my body of work is something that's really, um, significant you know, and, mm -hmm. and really helpful. So That's I'm amazing. really excited to share it with people and get them to, I have actually bonus tools that if they go to my website and they click on the unflappable link, there are a few tools that the editor was like, Nope, you just don't have any more room. You can't add those in. So I stuck them to the side and there are a few uh, tools they can download. They click on the unflappable link on my website. Awesome. Yeah. The next question I usually ask, I'm not going to ask you. I'm just going to tell you it's there. It's usually <laughs> what's next for your writing, but I know this is a, this is your seventh book. Seventh, yep. Seventh. So I'm not going to ask you that. But when you come back on to talk about a book that's impacted you, that's yeah. not that's not one of yours. I'll ask you because I want to oh, give yeah. you some time after the book a goes little. out, and yeah. you know, just a little time. I'm not going to push you on that one, but just be ready for for the next I love time. It. I love um, it. So instead, I'll ask you. If you do come back for an episode talking about yeah. a book that has impacted you, that's yeah. not one of yours. What book Ooh. do you think? What book? You know, and I since just, I'm putting you on the spot, if you want to mention one or two, no, it's okay. So one of the ones that I um, that I'm actually in the middle of reading, but the premise is so important. I think you'll really resonate with this. Is um, who not how? And I'm forgetting the name, uh, Dan Peck, maybe. Anyway, I, I, I apologize because I wasn't thinking about it. So That's right. It's okay. Um, but it's Who Not How. And it talks about the fact that so many times, especially as entrepreneurs and business owners and managers, leaders, we think we have to figure out how to get to the finish line instead of thinking, who do we know who can help us get to the finish line? Who has the skills that we need? And really, and I did my dissertation on social networks. So it's really looking Oof. at your social network. Yeah. And, uh, and appreciating that other people are better equipped to do parts of the things that you need than you are and you exhausting yourself trying to add the skills or figure something out or trudge through something is not an effective use and it's not scalable. So it's figuring I mean, out it, how do you do that. It's that badge of honor. Yeah. I can take it all on myself or I'll try to figure it out myself or. Right. It's an old contract, which is like, if I only, if I do it by myself, am I worthy versus if I, mm. and if I ask for help, then I'm weak or I'm, you know incompetent or something when in fact and i ask this question again when i do workshops i ask people say uh, who, who in the audience likes to help someone when they're asked because of their expertise and talent and something and everyone's like me and then yeah. i say okay how many of you like to ask other people for help and they're like no uh. one <laughs> and i yeah. and i and and in my in my stylistic way i said you're the biggest uh group of selfish people i've ever seen like yeah. so how selfish are you what are you yeah. doing you're holding back from other people the opportunity to do what you love to do. Don't you think they love it too? It's not yeah. about being burdened with BS that you don't want to do. I mean, I'm not saying like everyone loves being asked to do stuff that they don't have the capacity yeah. to do. Yeah. But when it's an informed ask, like you're so good at this, I would be so grateful if you were able to put your skills and your talents into doing this. Could you do this for me? People are like, I'm honored. Like, yeah. wow, they thought of me, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I, I tell students too. Those that are curious about they're not sure what their next role is going to be yeah. or what they want to go into or how they're going to use this degree. I'm like, now's the best time for networking. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Start building Bridget, that network. you and I, this <laughs> is the second time we're working. We've worked together for three hours. To me, this is designing value. Right. Like exactly. to me, that's a point of pride with me. These conversations are designing value. Right. And I haven't met you at all. Yeah. You know, it, it, when, and I think we only live like two or three towns away from each other. <laughs> we got to fix um, that, by the way, John. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But that's just an example of, yeah. you know, paying attention to your network. Right. I, I'm 
constantly on LinkedIn, paying attention to who's out there. And yeah. I told them, if you're curious about somebody, if you come across somebody who's commenting on somebody you know, or they're engaging yeah. in some way, and there's just a name that always pops up and you see the title and maybe you go to their page or you see what they're writing, right? ask them for virtual coffee. Right. Like and no here's one, the thing. anybody so, worth their weight in gold is going to say, absolutely. Like I'd love to thing. share, but <laughs> I'd if love to share about myself. Yeah. And this is where we have to stop the internal dialogue that stops us from moving forward with those asks mm. is if they don't, do you want to be connected to them anyway? Mm, exactly. And the answer is no. So exactly. the, there is no, no, yeah. right. There's only a, not this person, yes. right? Like yes. you're, you're not losing anything. You're just, you've, now decided that person doesn't belong in my network because that person is, and it's not a judgment. It's just a, no, they're not a fit for me. They don't, not they're not going to be authentic with me. Right. Such a great point to make. Um, cause I always say it, unfortunately it's a game of numbers. Yeah. Um, not in that people are expendable, but if somebody says no, like they're, they're, there's somebody past that no, and there's somebody that does want to help. So I think that's a big lesson yeah. for people to take away is just, there's too many people out there. If somebody's right. not quite giving you the value that you can exchange with them, like there's, right. there are people out there, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's amazing. So it's amazing. You have to get through those no's to get to the yes that you deserve. Absolutely. So keep going with the no's. Yeah. So in wrapping up, is there anything else you want to share? Obviously the book is coming out within the week. Is there anything yeah. else that you want to share that you have coming up, Bridget? Yeah, no, I just, um, I've got a, they won't probably hear this in time for that, but I've got a launch event on Monday the 16th. Um, I've got the book uh, hits the um, bookshelf on uh, October 17th. And I'd love them to head over to my website, reach out to me if they have a desire to talk to me at all about coaching or doing a workshop for them or, you know, doing some management or, you know, training. I would love to be able to help in their, you know, leadership and coaching needs. And, you know, pick up a copy of Unflappable. You want to hop on a call and talk about your favorite or part about it or question about it. You can get a free 15 minute call on my website as well. Absolutely amazing. One of my favorite Thanks. people doing the best Thank work you. just based on just everything. Your, your story, your history, like the books Thank that you. you're putting out there, how you're trying to help people. Uh, you. You're the best. Just uh, right back you know, at you, John. When, when the person reached out and said that they took that away from your story. It doesn't yeah. surprise me at all. It doesn't surprise me at all. So again, that's just one of those things where it resonated with them. Yeah. Um, they, maybe they didn't know uh, other people that had that experience. I'm sure they've met them, but to hear somebody mention it in their story, right. um, it's just right. great. It's amazing. So thank you for that. Yeah. No one's alone. You know, as, as alone as sometimes we feel in our experience, yeah. I can tell you, and you can, you can tell your listeners this too, from all the people you've known and coached you know what's under the hood, right? So the people who are out there, we cannot judge our insides to other people's outsides. Mm. And so when we really listen, we ha listen to conversations like the one you and I had today, you start to hear my insides. If you looked at just my outsides, that's not what you might guess, right? That's not yeah. what you would, that's not the story you might tell about me. And yeah. so I think it's really important <laughs> to, to settle ourselves in that. That's why I love this series, because I get to that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, I, like I say, like on LinkedIn, people share things, they yeah, write books, but there's something right. about hearing your tone, your yeah. words, your experiences, your emotion come through right. in that conversation. So I'm totally um, so grateful Thank for, you. for meeting you and for having Same. these two conversations and for the many more to come. Absolutely, John. Thank you so much. And Bridget's book again is Unflappable, How Smart People Quit Overthinking, Ditch the Drama and Thrive at Work. If there's anything that I might have missed, anything you're curious about, anything that I should have covered, we're limited on time. I already dragged her here for an hour and 22 <laughs> minutes. Reach out to me. I'll reach out to her, see what kind of feedback or insights I can get Got on it. that. But in the meantime, thank you for watching and listening, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.